This is where defense procurement, where defense manufacturing are going. Um, we're now going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about some project work. Uh, you're you're going to hear about the, uh, the portfolio of work that's occurring um, within the Army and being sponsored by the Army. And then we're going to talk specifically about the uh, kind of some of the technical capabilities that have been developed that uh, you're going to be seeing if you're doing business with the DOD um, here in the very near future. So <clears throat> our first two speakers after the break are going to do kind of a tag team presentation. And um, this, is, this is the portfolio of activities uh, in the model-based enterprise arena that is being sponsored by the Army. And um, Army Mantech has really been a, a DOD leader in terms of uh, the work that they're doing to help develop the technical infrastructure to enable MBE to be implemented throughout manufacturing enterprises. And we're fortunate to have Paul Huang and, and Paul Villanova as our Army speakers. But Paul Huang has, has been the sponsor for the, the, the project work that, that, that we've been in, involved with, with, you know, involving BAE systems and, and MEP. And uh, Paul is, uh, uh, he, he's, he's been active from the Army Research Laboratory, and his, his, uh, his bio is in your handout. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Uh, he he su supports the Army, uh, the RRL program manager, and the Armor Manufacturing Technology Objective through model-centric design technology development. He also works with the Army Mantech program to incorporate MBE and detect data publications and thereby strengthen the argument for changing the appropriate standards in relation to MBE. So Paul's got a pretty strong focus on the standards aspect of this, which is very important. As we get into the technical details, you, you, you're going to see that we're not pushing a software package as part of this. We're pushing interoperability. Um, Paul Villanova, our other speaker, he's the MBE project lead for the uh, Army, excuse me, the Armament Research Development and Engineering Center, or RDEC. Um, Paul works primarily out of uh, Picatinny Arsenal uh, in New Jersey. And uh, he's also involved in, in OSD and Mantec, uh, Army Mantech project activities and supporting development of 3D digital work instructions for Letterkenny Army Depot. So with that, I'd like to introduce Paul Wong. Good morning. You guys see me okay? <laughs> oh, I can stand to the side. Um, just a raise of hands. Before today, how many people knew what model-based enterprise or model-based definition? So, okay, so I, we don't have to go too much into detail. And then, um, <clears throat> how many people are actually capable of receiving CAD and STEP files? Great. See, see the rumors are false. Supply chain's ready. So our management keeps telling us supply chain can't handle 3D CAD data. And we keep telling them, it's like, you know, you got to give credit to the supply chain. They're ready to do business with us. We, we just haven't, we've been lagging in this process. Because you guys have been dealing with the primes for a long time, and the primes have been dealing in the 3D world for a long time. It's just DOD hasn't. So what we want to try to focus on is model-based enterprise is already happening with, with or without DOD. But we have to understand how to accept this data and manage this data, internally and externally. So we're going to go over some of the programs that uh, are being funded from Army Mantech, OSD Mantech, and also the IBIF. So traditionally, DOD has accepted data with 2D, you know, level 3 data as the product master. So what we're focusing on now is moving away from 2D flat drawings as the product master to 3D CAD systems and associated files as the product master. So what, what we've learned is everybody has a perception of what is a CAD file and what isn't in a CAD file. So we've been working with trying to develop terminology and, and definitions to say what is a fully annotated model? What, what information should that include? And then for our life cycle activities, what are some of the information we need to do our jobs? Because we don't need a fully annotated model. We don't need everything under the sun for certain life cycle activities. But for sustaining a weapon platform over the next 30, 40, 50 years, it'd be nice to have the total technical data package that includes everything you can think of. That's nice to have. But how much is that going to cost us? 
an arm and a leg, maybe two legs. But we have to understand, if it costs us upfront in acquisition, it's going to save us a lot in sustainment. So when we talk about model-based definition, there's, there's what we generically have a definition for that and then a generic definition for model-based enterprise. So, but what the key is reusing data during the life cycle because that's where we can gain the benefits of savings, of buying that te technical data package up front. So you've seen a little bit of this chart during Brench's briefing. So we can really see in past experience that, you know, acquisition cost isn't the costliest item in a weapon life cycle. But during sustainment, that's where the bulk of the money is spent. So, you know, you've heard us already, is we're, we're putting together a team. <clears throat> I'm, Rick and I are probably the, the rookies on, and, and also Paul Villanova, we're, we're the rookies on this MBE because we've only been working this space probably the last couple of years. So what we try to do is, you know, we don't claim to be the experts, so we try to put the team together where we try to capture the experts in the field. So we put together a team where we have the OSD, Army, all the major services, and also, what we also see as key is getting industry participation because industry has been doing it for a while. And then the, to implement this technology is we also have to get the buy-ins from the software vendors and the software developers because when we put these standards together is unless the technology tools are out there, it's hard to deliver on those standards without the software vendors understanding what our needs are and giving us push button capabilities. Instead of having to do it manually, we want to automate this process as much as possible. So where we saw MBE in the past was basically model-based design reuse, intelligent manufacturing, innovation manufacturing, execution, basically reusing data at an enterprise level, and enterprise collaboration. So seamless automation of data exchanges from internally and externally. So how we fit in the you know, Mantec strategic plan. We're not going to go through this. We're going to, I'm going to try to catch up on the time. Um, some of the programs that we have in place uh, is in the design production under the future combat system. This ATO we had started back in 2004, 2005 time frame. So our goal was to change the way we did business. Is traditional was 2D, was the product master. We didn't really have PDMs or PLMs. But what we wanted to move forward to is all the primes are really designing in CAD. So why are we deriving 2D drawings off the model master already at the prime? So we want to change that practice. So, but <clears throat> when you do that is you need good definition so everybody's on the same page in terms of what is a fully annotated model. What are the critical model information and associated data that everybody needs to do their job? So. <clears throat> If industry and the associations out there don't have something ready for us, then we need to develop something within government. So that's where 31,000 was going towards, is because it takes a while for industry and the standard organization to get consensus. But for our weapon systems, we have some major programs that are underway and going to be underway that we want to move in this direction. So the DOD standard, we, we need to develop those. But we also understand that, you know, if we develop a good baseline, we want to transition this off to the standard organizations like AIA, ASME, ISO STEP folks. So that's why we, when we have these meetings, those folks are participating heavily on standards activities. So one of, one of the success stories we see of applying MBE, uh, I, I took out the prime on this because we don't want to implicate them too much. But they were very helpful in providing some expertise in the model-based enterprise. So one of the things was, what kind of cost savings can we really incur if we practice this? So two teams within this company made a proposal to build egress trainer, which is basically an MRAP vehicle that is on a roll cage so that soldiers can learn how to get out of the vehicle if it encountered an IED, so if it flipped over. So one team was traditional business practice, 2D drawings. They don't reuse data. So their estimate to build that trainer was 
hours. The model base enterprise team was able to do that in about 1,000 hours. So you see the cost savings. I mean, not every program is going to have this type of cost saving, but this is the potential that's out there if we do implementation right. So part of the thing is you can do this wrong and you won't get this kind of cost savings. So implementing the right way is key. So one of the things we also try to do is everything, every time we do some implementation is we want to capture that lessons learned so that next time we do it, hopefully, we don't make the same mistakes. You know, everybody's heard the analogy, a picture's worth a thousand words. So recently I was at an AIA meeting, some Boeing folks told me what internally, how they help sell the program to their management is a picture's worth a thousand words. An animation or video is worth a thousand pictures. And, that, and that's true, because how many people work on their cars or work on things and have to go through manuals and picture diagrams, but you can't decipher what, what do I really have to do to get that part out? But if you had animation work instruction that shows you this step-by-step -step process in two minutes, so having that animation really can save you lots of hours. And for me, I'm the first one to admit, if I have to put something together, I never read a manual until I screw up. Then I go back and say, okay, I, I, I need to go <laughs> figure out what I did wrong. So, but having that animation there, boy, I would love, you know, any furniture or toys for my kids that I have to put together. I would love it. Just give me a DVD, show me how to put that together. Man, I, it would save me a ton of time. So that's where we think the ability of MBE can really benefit the, the tech pub world. This is another uh, success story from the striker. So the key here is the training time for, for the maintenance folks is they saw at least a 25% savings in time to train the folks how to do the maintenance. And then if you look at, <clears throat> this is on their PBL, performance-based logistics contract, so um, the, the labor savings potentially is, is significant. So then in our depots, we did some assessments at the depots. Where, where are they today in terms of technology and ability? So our depots are very good at reverse engineering because we don't do a good job providing them data. So most of the time, when a weapon comes into the depot, they don't have the full tech data package, so they have to reverse engineer it. So they're very good at that. But if we do our job in the acquisition phase and get the tech data, and now they have the, the, the digital data, it can save them tons of hours on being more efficient to get the weapon system back out to the field. So typically, <coughs> Work instructions are still 2D flat files, a lot of text. Uh, we don't really have a database manager of data. You know, sometimes they, it's a file cabinet. You go pull the files that you need, the drawings. So, but having the models and then doing the simulation using some of the tools available out there, you know, we saw significant reductions in time and efficiencies. So we've, we've done a couple of uh, pilot programs, one at Red River Army Depot and the other ones at Letterkenny Army Depot to use model-based enterprise technology and tools to help them be more efficient. So one of, at R River Army Depot, what we did was took <clears throat> the Bradley Cross Drive trans transmission. We, we told them we, we help them use, learn these tools and train them. So they picked their toughest piece of equipment, which had over 2,000 parts. What we learned in this process is, no, that wasn't a very good idea because it's a very complicated process. They're basically doing it once and then they forget it because there's not a lot of repetition. You take a few small projects, get the people familiar in the tools so that they do repetitive work on small projects and then tackle a big project to make it more efficient so that the learning curve is you step it through a process.